Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to our 10 a.m. virtual education program. We are outside on this lovely day, which is always a good time, but of course, there are things we can't control, like the utility truck over there. So I'm going to try and talk super loud today. Hopefully, you all can hear us. Um, but before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors, Topeka Collegiate and the Kokari Foundation for sponsoring these classes. It is crazy to think that this is the last week of our education programs. And today, we are going to focus on our final fourth grade lesson. Now this time, we are going to talk all about how humans get our own energy that we need for survival. Now I'm not talking about food energy, I'm talking about things like fuel and electricity and how we power our homes and our cars and our businesses and our technology. So today we are going to first do a lesson and then we are going to meet a super cute animal that is affected by our own energy consumption. So while, as we get started, I want to first talk about renewable versus non-renewable energy sources. And these may be two words that you've heard before. What a renewable energy source is, is this a source of energy that we have plenty of. We can continue using it over time. We will not run out of it. And many of our renewable energy resources are natural, which means they come from the environment. So this image here is some um, is four examples of renewable energy sources, all of which are natural. They come from nature. So the first example here is wind. Wind is a renewable energy source because we're never gonna run out of wind. We can use wind constantly. And wind power is something that is very easily generated through these big mechanisms. Especially if you drive through western Kansas, you might have seen these big wind turbines out in the prairies. These big wind turbines are constantly moving and humans can use the energy generated from that wind power as a way to power our own homes and businesses and things like that. So wind is our first renewable energy source and it comes from natural things like wind. Another example is solar. Here you can see some guys working to put up solar panels on a roof. Solar comes from the sun and it is a renewable energy source because sunlight is a constant. We can always use it. So solar panels pick up on that sun and they are able to convert it to electricity, to energy that we can use to power our own homes. Now the third example of a renewable energy source that humans use is hydroelectric. And hydro just refers to water. So this is getting power by fast moving water. Here you can see an example of where humans have built a dam. And that dam collects the fast moving water in a river and it allows it to turn into electricity that humans can use. So hydroelectric is just the fancy word of getting electricity from water. And again, it is renewable because we can constantly use it. We're not gonna run out of water. And it's from a natural source, from the environment. Now the final one is interesting. This is geothermal. And this is a renewable uh, resource because we are simply utilizing the hot steam and water that is under the ground and we are capturing it to power our own businesses. So geothermal is the final renewable natural resource because this just refers to getting heat from the ground. Geo means underground and thermal means heat. So all four of these are excellent examples of renewable natural energy sources that allow us humans to power many of the things that we use every single day. Now, much of our electricity is powered by what we call fossil fuels. And these are examples of things like oil, coal, and natural gas. Now, all of these 
these do come from the earth. They are a natural resource in that we mine them or we drill for them underneath the ground, but they are not renewable. Oil, coal, and natural gas are just differing forms of what we call a fossil fuel. Oil is a dark liquid that we get from the ground. Coal is a dark brown or blackish solid that we get from the ground. And natural gas is a vapor, right? It's a flammable vapor that we get from the ground as well. Now these, there are a finite amount of them. And finite means there's only so much of them before we run out. So this is non-renewable because we can only use so much before there isn't any more left. Now when I talk about fossil fuels, what I really mean is actually using fossils as a fuel. Coal, oil, and natural gas, it is stored in the ground. And what originally was, was dead plants and animals that died millions of years ago. And over time, heat and pressure pushed those dead fossils of the animals and plants underneath the ground. And they turned them into things like coal and oil and natural gas. That heat and pressure shifted the carbon that was in those plants and animals after they died, they turned over time into carbon and hydrogen that is used in coal, oil, and natural gas. And humans are able to extract these fossil fuels, which are literally dead plants and animals over millions of years, add heat to them, and it turns into energy that we as humans are able to power our homes and our businesses and our cars with. So when you hear fossil fuels, they are referring to these three things, and it's literally fossils from millions of years ago that have been turned into these coal, oil, and natural gas that when combined with heat, we can use to power much of our everyday lives. Now, as I said, these are non-renewable resources because there's only so much earth that we can mine and we can drill for before we run out of fossil fuels as a way to use electricity. So humans really need to shift to more renewable resources because in the future, we're not gonna run out of wind or, or sun or water or earth's heat but we are going to run out of the fossils that have died and changed over millions of years. Now both renewable and non-renewable sources do sometimes have effects on the environment. So things like dams, although hydroelectricity or water power is good and renewable, there are still tolls that it takes on the environment. If you look at this top picture, you can see this was an area in 1987. It looks kind of like a mountainous area with trees and a river running through it. But in 2006, almost 20, 30 years later, um, this actually shifted, okay? So it shifted. Look at the, uh, the pattern here. So there used to be a lot of trees. Now the trees are cut down along the way. There is a dam in place. So it is affecting habitat loss over that 20 year period from 1987 to 2006. So this is imposing on the habitat that plants and animals need to survive. We've cut down trees and built a dam which is affecting the flow of water for some of those animals and homes for it. So even renewable energy sources like water power do still have an effect on the environment. So do mining. So many of the fossil fuels, the oil and the coal and the natural gas, it, we have to mine for it. And as you can see, this used to be a nice forested area that has now been cut down as we drill large holes in the earth to get our own fuel sources. And that is then leading to habitat loss. There's no trees, no water, no space for animals here as humans are taking over those places for our own fuel needs. Now one final effect that um, energy, our own energy has on the environment, aside from habitat loss and air pollution, burning fossil fuels has a lot of air pollution to it. One final issue is oil spills. Much of the oil that we get is found in the ocean. They have to drill for it in the ocean. And back in 2010, 
then, there was actually the largest oil spill of all time. It was from BP, and the red was the deep water horizon. And what happened was something went wrong as they were mining and drilling for that oil, and it spilled, and it spilled all over the Gulf of Mexico in the ocean. 4.9 million t uh, um, barrels of oil got dumped into the ocean. Almost 5 million barrels. And that um, oil spill was leaking for almost five months. So over time, the beautiful ocean ecosystem, which was thriving for many marine plants and animals, turned into this. Oil spills are a huge problem when we're trying to get the oil that we need for our cars. And over the five months that oil was pouring into the ocean, thousands of animals died or got caught in the oil. So this picture is of a sea turtle, a starfish, a pelican, and an otter, all of which had oil all over them. Now there were rescue efforts to try and save many of these animals, and Dawn Dish Soap actually worked quite well to get the oil off of them and not harm the animal. And while several hundreds and thousands of animals were saved, thousands more perished in these oil spills. So humans in our own energy needs and the way that we get oil, both from renewable sources and non-renewable sources, does have effects on the environment. So we need to be very careful how we use that energy, where we get it from, and we need to make sure that and whenever possible we are preserving ecosystems, plant and animal life because our own needs cannot damage the needs of plants and animals which we rely on for survival as well. So if you are in fourth grade, I've got an energy and the environment crossword for you. It talks all about the renewable and non-renewable sources that we just discussed and our effects of energy on the environment. So if you guys just want to fill this out, take a picture and put it in the comments. It's a good review for what we learned today. Now you guys, the animal that we are going to meet today is an animal who could be affected by an oil spill. Now this particular species likes to live in uh, rivers, however there are some of their wild uh, relatives that like to live in the ocean. So I have put my mask on and we are going to go meet Tracy, who is the keeper of our river otters, which is a marine animal that could be affected by our own energy needs. So let's walk on over here, and we are going to find Tracy. Hey, Tracy. Hi. So just as a safety precaution, we are wearing our masks when talking about our otters. And Tracy is actually putting his mask on, and I believe he has some food for our otters as well. So we're gonna go up here and talk about this super cute mammal. Okay, so yeah, I'm Tracy. I'm one of the carnivore keepers, which include the otters. And uh, as you can see, I've got some otter food right here. Now I'm not going to be giving them a whole lot because they did get uh, a snack and their breakfast already. Uh, but we do like to give them, you know, at least three, uh, ideally four different feedings throughout the day. Uh, same amount of food day in and day out, but we do like to break that up. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So, if you can see there, uh, Tony is the darker color otter, and his brother Albert is the lighter color one. Uh, typically, Tony will line up on the right side as we look at him, and Albert will line up on the left as we look at him. They've been trained to do that, and they just kind of do that without us even asking now. So that's kind of cool, especially if somebody's trying to learn which one's which. So, um, I'm just gonna start by giving them a few things. Like uh, shrimp, for example. These guys, uh, they're really good eaters. Um, fish is the main portion of their diet uh, here at the zoo and in the wild. So they like a lot of different things, but fish is what I would say their favorite. So again, I'm not gonna be giving them a whole lot here, but 
just wanted you guys to kind of see some of this. They're pretty good at catching it, Tracy, kind of like a dog. Yeah, they are real good. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Tony to go swimming for me, and then I'm going to throw him uh, a small fish. There he goes, right on cue. They're good boys. Um, yeah, sometimes they, they do that. It, it's nothing, nothing at all. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and put their fish away, their food away. Like I said, I'm not gonna give them much. Um, so again, Tony and Albert, these guys are brothers. Uh, they were actually born at the Wichita Zoo. Um, so North American river otters. Uh, these guys, they actually have a lot of, a lot of different names, uh, 11 to be exact, but it's all the same animal. Uh, here at the zoo, we just call them otters. Um, so these guys are really cool. They're smart. Uh, we do a lot of different training techniques with them, uh, and they're very anxious to do it. You know, sure, we give them a reward, they're, you know, a piece of food, but a lot of times they're kind of ahead of us. They, they know by our movements and our gestures what we're gonna ask them and they just do it. So they're really smart. Uh, they have a really fast metabolism. So that's, that's one of the main reasons we spread out their different feedings throughout the day. Uh, one meal or you know a, a feeding time will go through their body in, in as little as an hour. So, that's a couple things, you know, we give them the multiple feedings and they, it also allows them to scent mark or, you know, to poop a lot. Uh, and these guys, they, they literally will do a poop dance where they kind of, they trot back and forth on their legs and kind of move side by side and then they'll do their thing. Uh, kind of helps it get out of them, but they're doing this you know, because they're communicating with each other. Now, obviously, it's just the two males. You know, they're brothers. Obviously, you know, we're not going to do any any uh, breeding or anything. Uh, but they still instinctively uh, leave all the scent marks, just because that's one of their ways they communicate. They do have different vocals they can make. Um, most of the time, I don't hear those though. You know, I've already cleaned in here today. Uh, it would have been kind of cool to show you guys just how much they do poop. It's pretty interesting. But again, if you think it think of it in terms of language, it makes sense. Um, how old did you say they were? I did not. So the otters are 11 years old. In fact, they just turned 11 mid-March. Um, so they're roughly mid-life for, for animals in a zoo. Um, Otters in human care tend to live around 20 years. Uh, in the wild, eight or nine years is, is about the most they can get. Uh, so obviously, you know, we provide a lot of care, you know, from, from just everyday care to enrichment to, to vet needs. Um, and it shows, which is why they live so long. Um, What's so, they, they spend a third of their life in the water. So out of every 24 hour day, they're in the water eight hours. Now that's just an overall estimate, but if you kind of think of it like that, that is a lot of time in the water. As you can see them swimming around, you know, they are definitely built for the water. They have the streamlined bodies. Uh, they have two different coats. Uh, the underneath coat is to keep them warm. They'll swim in the water any time of the year, you know, and we fill it for them any time we can. You know, it'd be 20 degrees out and they're out there swimming like it's nothing. So it's kind of cool to see that. It doesn't phase them. You know, they have the web feet, they have the small ears. Anytime they go underwater, all that just closes up like a submarine. Uh, they do have goggles that go over their eyes, a uh, thin membrane that protects their eyes. They do see pretty well although they are nearsighted, so they don't see things particularly well from a distance. But underwater and, and on land, they can see really well uh, up close. Um, and they can hold their breath by uh, eight minutes, excuse me. So that's, that's a long time, especially considering a hippo can hold their breath five minutes, and that's a huge animal. So these guys can hold their breath for eight minutes. 
pretty spectacular. Wow. And Tracy, could you also talk a little bit about their yard? I know a lot of the times when people come, they see the slides and the logs yeah. and all sorts of stuff. No, absolutely. So every day we drain the pool, we hose it, and we fill it. You know, these guys will get it, get it dirty. As you can see, they, they bring mulch in with them, straw, sand, um, which is why we always clean it out. Um, we put different enrichment toys in there. You know, I, I put the little box in there as kind of a diving platform. They may or may not use. Sometimes we put it in the water. They do use it in there. Same thing with the slide, uh, with the floating bowl. Um, I'll put I'll put a couple fish in there or something, and they'll get it. And that's probably why it has the water in it now. Um, we'd like to change up their environment every day. Uh, some of the things are kind of fixed, like the big logs that you may see, big rocks. Um, but we add different substrates, so you'll have you know the mulch, you'll have some gravel, some sand, uh, and even even some mud in a couple areas, grass. Um, these guys, they're called river otters, but they'll live anywhere where any kind of body of water is. So they're used to having all kinds of different substrate, uh, and they do enjoy it. When they're done swimming for a while, you'll, you'll see them kind of rolling around or sliding on the ground, um, partly for their scent, but also just so they dry up faster. They, they use the ground as like a towel. Well, that's fascinating. Okay, so we're going to take some questions from home. Um, okay. I know they already, you already answered it, but what's their favorite food? Um, it, we give them the smelt fish. Mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of reiterate the smaller, these are the smelt fish. That's their favorite. Uh, recently, we're getting some squid and shrimp in here. Uh, and that's just because we're not using it as quickly for the sharks. Um, so the otters definitely cash in on that. We have the herring, which is the bigger one. They, they enjoy it, but they will definitely eat the smelt first if they're, the two are together. And then some carrots. Uh, we do give them multiple carrots every day, and that's mainly a filler food for them. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll poop that out pretty quickly, and it's, they don't digest it real well, but it's a good filler food for them. Um, and Bianca wants to know, um, do they have a favorite toy? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they really do like that big green slide, and in fact, we do some training exercises that utilize that. Um, you know, I, I can't do them in the circumstance we have right now, but they do know to go slide, so they'll actually go over there on command and slide down the slide. Now, of course, normally they'll just utilize it from time to time, and we have another play set that has a smaller slide, which they do utilize. In fact, it was in there yesterday. I just took it out today. Um, they, they are pretty interactive with their toys. Uh, Albert, the lighter color one, he kind of likes stuffed animals, so when I put those out, or when, when anybody puts those out, you know, he'll go check them out, rub on them a little bit. Albert has a tendency not to do that. So they, they both have their, their kind of preferences. Okay, um, and Cammy wants to know, how do you tell if it's a male or a female? Are there any size differences or color differences um, or anything like that? Color, no. Uh, the males are bigger, so these guys, Let's see, they're around 16 pounds. Uh, Albert's 16, Tony's 15. The, male, the females are gonna be smaller than that. <clears throat> um, and if you can see from his underside, that's another way that, that you can tell as well. Okay, and uh, Adrian wants to know, do they play? Yeah, they absolutely play. You know, I have multiple recordings. Um, one of their favorite things, in the winter is to run and slide on the snow. Now I've, I've got this on my phone, but they can slide for a good 20 feet, which is really cool to see. Um, they play with each other. Sometimes they'll wrestle around in the water, sometimes on the land, but they are a very playful animal, yes. Okay, wonderful. And um, somebody want, uh, asked you to ask again, uh, how long can they stay in the water? Uh, eight minutes. Okay, and how long do they normally, like, throughout the day, you said in a 24-hour period? Yeah, uh, they're in the water a third of their life, so about eight hours, eight hours every a day, day yeah. is, is kind of the average. That's amazing. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying how cute they are and how fun they are to watch as they swim. Yeah, I'll tell you, people love the otters. You know, I'm no exception. 
Uh, we do we do behind the scenes here at the zoo, and a lot of them are for the otters. Right. A lot of them are talking about why uh, they're flipping. They're asking why are they flipping, and do they flip in the air? Uh, not so much in the air. Uh, the the back dive is kind of a Tony behavior. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm not so sure that we like that behavior. And there's other times where he's sitting here, he's got a full belly. Um, they're nice and relaxed, not a care in the world, and he's doing the backflips. Uh, he doesn't look like he's stressed out or anything. So sometimes I'm not so sure that that's so bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, it just might yeah, be something they like. Just their individual behaviors. Sure. Um, and Charlene asks, um, well, do they have a favorite food? We covered that one with the smell. Is there a favorite spot in their enclosure that they like? Um, I don't think I could say like one favorite spot. You know, sometimes you'll find them up in the corner of their exhibit, up front, kind of by the viewing window in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I find them underneath all the logs, kind of more in the middle of the exhibit. Um, those might be the two most predominant areas, obviously in the water right. itself. Um, Bianca wants to know is how big can they get? I mean, these two are full grown. Do river otters get much bigger? Uh, they really don't. Um, these guys are at a healthy weight, you know, 15, 16 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you read, I think it says that these guys can get up to 30 pounds, but that it doesn't even sound right to me. They would be uh, obese for sure. Pretty overweight pounds. in that, yeah. I mean, that'd be twice what they weigh now. So they're at a real good weight. You know, again, they're 11 years old, so roughly midlife. Uh, so they're at a real healthy weight at 15, 16 pounds. Charlene's asking, are their feet wet? Uh, they are, yes. Yep. Uh, they can dive. You know, sometimes we do these things with them. They can dive from the from the land into the water, and it's it's just a split second um, pushing off the edge. So they don't always do it that way. They use their feet sometimes, but um, they are totally built for the water and they love it. Right, um, and? Oh, in fact, I just thought of uh, at about two months, the, the mother otter will bring the babies into the water so they start learning how to swim. Oh, cool. Two months, that's, that's really young. That's really young, yeah. Um, Adri wants to know, do they have a favorite enrichment item or food or toy? Yeah, the, the smelt fish right. would be a favorite food for sure. Food, uh, food motivated, huh? Uh, very much so, yep. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, do the otters have to be put up when you clean the area? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Now, they have had the free contact training before with my boss, Shanna, and with a former keeper, uh, Jamie. Uh, and we are actually working towards doing that again. They, they really do enjoy that interaction. Uh, but we just have to be 100% on our game at all times when we're doing free contact. They are dangerous. They've got a nasty bite and a lot of sharp teeth. Um, so they do enjoy that. And we will hopefully get there um, by next springtime is, is kind of my goal. Um, why are their tails so long? Yeah, the, I don't think I even mentioned this, but a, their tail is a third of the length of their body. So that helps them in the water. They can make the real sharp turns. You know, fish aren't just gonna let you catch them and eat them. And otters love fish the most of all. So they're, they're equipped with the tools to catch those fish. And the tail is definitely one of them. Right, it helps with balance. Oh right. yeah, even on land. Yeah, they can stand up. Um, and of course they use their tail to balance them when they're standing up. Um, how much sleep uh, do they get a day? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, these guys in the wild, they're typically like a crepuscular or, and or nocturnal animal. So they're sleeping all day long. Um, now, from what I remember, I don't think they sleep excessively, you know, like cats do or anything. Um, these guys are very versatile. So here at the zoo, they're actually diurnal. They are active during the day and then they sleep at night. So they roughly sleep for an eight hour period, kind of like, like we do. Okay, and that was somebody's next question. Are they nocturnal? So the answer is- Yeah, in, in the, the wild, wild they are. Um, and then also being active at dusk and dawn each day. As it turns to winter where it's real cold, they actually turn to being diurnal. 
active during the day mm -hmm. just because it's so cold, it gets so much colder at night. <laughs> um, and sorry, we just flipped the camera on us. Um, <laughs> Um, and Charlene wants to know, you already covered this, but are they going to be bred? I know these two are brothers, so we're not planning in the future for females. Uh, nothing that I'm aware of. Uh, otters are not endangered, um, so no. Short okay. answer, no. Uh, and Charlene wants to ask, can you hold them? Uh, no, that would be a real bad day right. uh, for <laughs> us. Yeah, they bite, uh, you know, they can bite your finger off, so... Um, there has been people that's been injured from them, um, you know, back in the old days where things were done differently. Right. So definitely not, uh, cannot hold them. Right, I mean, they look super cute and cuddly, but they would not appreciate being held or petted or anything like oh, that. Oh no, no, um, they would not. <laughs> Catherine says, hi from Chicago. Who is the friendliest? Is, are either of them particularly friendly? Oh. Uh, um, I don't think one is any more friendly than the other. You know, they're they're both eager to please, eager to train with you. Um, you know, obviously eager to receive their food. Uh, but I don't think one is any more eager or more friendly than right. the other. Kind of goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, they don't want to be petted or yeah. touched or anything. Yeah, like that. exactly. Um, Bianca wants to know, can they climb? Uh, they they can climb right across. You see the log going over the pool. They can climb across that. Uh, the logs that you see in the exhibit, but they're not gonna, you know, climb up up a tree like a squirrel or anything mm -hmm. like that. They they do not have that ability. Somebody asked if they were uh, males or females, and these are both males. They are brothers. Yeah, both males, 11 years old, and brothers born at the Wichita Zoo here in Kansas. Um, Charlene wants to know uh, who, what animals they are related to. Ah, uh, well, they're in the weasel family. Um, so you got, uh, you know, the various otters, weasels, uh, wolverines, ferrets, uh, ferrets right. yeah. uh, um, minks, badgers, right. minks, yeah, all right. those. There's some others. Yeah, so they're related to weasels, not to dogs or cats. They're in the weasel family. That's correct. Okay, I think we covered all of the questions. We had a lot of great questions today. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Was there some at the top? Oh, okay. During the lesson. Oh, during the lesson. Okay, we're going all the way back up. Hello. Um, fossil fuels hurt the earth. Can fossil fuels hurt the earth, Bianca? Absolutely. Um, so not only do fossil fuels hurt the earth because we are mining and drilling the earth and getting rid of that habitat, but air pollution from them, we burn them, which adds a lot of pollution into the air, which makes it bad for us to breathe. And then things like when we spill them, like oil, um, that can absolutely harm the plants and animals, which is why we're talking about otters today, right? Absolutely. So absolutely, fossil fuels, we really need to shift our energy needs uh, to those renewable solar, wind, hydroelectric. We need to get off the fossil fuels. How can we make an impact in our own lives? Ooh, Anne, excellent question. <laughs> um, so one, just try and cut down on your electricity needs. So anytime you can turn off the lights when you're not using them, try and avoid the dryer that sucks up a lot of electricity. Um, get cars with good gas mileage, get cars that are hybrids. Um, don't drive as much. You can try and carpool, ride your bike, things like that. I mean, really just trying to cut down on your energy use whenever possible. If you're ever buying um, appliances, trying to get the ones that are energy friendly, same yeah. with your lights. That's I mean, just one. really paying attention to all of those um, energy efficient packaging on different types of appliances will help as well. Um, let's go back. Let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, a lot of people are saying it's so sad, the oil spills and things that we were talking about. Um, but you guys, you know, where we're humans do a lot of damage, we also do a lot of good. And so we, we don't always want to harp on the negative. We do a lot of things to help animals here at the Topeka Zoo and around the world. And you guys just being at home and watching now is one amazing thing. I mean, you're already taking that step toward uh, more knowledge, which is awesome. Okay, so let me see if we have any final questions. I am, there we go. I turned off the comments. Megan's laughing at me. Okay. Um, oh, will these otters ever be released into the wild? Uh, they will not. Now, again, there's no need to repopulate the in the wild, mm -hmm. and and these guys, you know, they've been in human care their whole life, so no, they will not. Right. Um, and how smart are they? Uh, they are highly intelligent animals. Um, you know, they're they're going to be right up there with with your type of dogs that are pretty intelligent as a good comparison. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, can they live in really cold areas? Bianca wants to know. Uh, they can, you know, just, just like here in Kansas, for example, uh, we get in the negative 20s in the winter and, and there are otters in Kansas, mm -hmm. so absolutely. Yeah, I know the Baker Wetlands uh, over in Lawrence, you can see some every once in a while. Yeah, and I, I had a guy tell me, one of our guests, that he's seen one over in Meriden just swimming across the pond oh that he was gosh. in. This is Albert right here, right? Being a snooze. That is Albert, yep. <laughs> he's so handsome. Yeah, they're good boys. And when, when his hair dries, by the way, he's really light, mm -hmm. like a blonde color. Yeah, that's how you can tell them apart. Albert's the lighter one. Yep. Alrighty, well that looks like the end of our questions. So Tracy, again, thank you so much for all of your wonderful knowledge. Thank you guys at home for watching. Um, and tomorrow we will be back with a fifth grade class on palm oil. And we're gonna meet a super cute animal family here at the Topeka Zoo. So we will see you guys tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.